Bismillah alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad an-nur kul sari wa madadaka al-jari wa jama'ni bihi fi kulli atwari wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ya nur So welcome to another episode a very very important episode I have my sheikh in front of me Dr. Shadi al-Masri Assalamu alaykum how you doing Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh thank you for having me on your show yeah, so let's just get into it. The, the first thing, well, first of all, obviously, this is about the soul. This is very controversial. It's um, something that's very misunderstood. Uh, probably the, the biggest thing in Islam that is a part of Islam that is very misunderstood. So um, we're going to get to the bottom of this, inshallah. Ta'ala. But the first thing that I wanted to ask you, Sheikh, mm. is... How did you come into contact with the Sawaf in the first place? Where were you? I mean, paint the whole picture uh, when you came in contact with the Sawaf, whether it was deviance type of Sawaf tasawwuf, or the real Sawaf. Paint the picture for us. All right. So uh, uh, it's interesting because we were just talking about this, believe it or not. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Around the 1990s, any Muslim in New Jersey was uh, def- there. There was no such thing as madhab and tasawwuf at that time. There were good and pious Muslims who were practicing Islam um, based upon different shiuch teaching from Egypt, from Palest- uh, Palestinian shiuch, from Palestine, from uh, maybe uh, Saudi uh, fatawa and works, and that's what Islam was to us, right? And as a young man. That's what the general exposure was. And not only the general exposure, that was the world. I knew that there were other nations in Islam, but that, that wasn't our world. This was our world. That's the only direct contact that we had. And um, it continued like that until I felt like I was sort of drying up, like um, drying up like a leaf and was no longer had the same himma as before. So Things always wane. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had mercy upon me and, and upon many others at that time. And Sheikh Hamza Yusuf started coming around. And he had a little, tiny, little group of following in New Brunswick, New Jersey, in Masjid al-Huda, which is now what we call MBIC, right? And though that group was some converts and some born Muslims mixed who had went and traveled and seen him and studied with him in New Mexico for two years in a row. Then one brother went to Syria okay, uh, and studied with him. And then another brother went to Syria and came back. And so that group was there and they were inviting shiuch and receiving shiuch. And to me, they were the el- they were like the older guys. And you're a high school kid, you want to hang out with the older guys, right? So we would always try to hang out with their little brothers and therefore hang out with them. So when it came time to be at Rutgers, they were the guys who we looked up to. And at the time, when I say Rutgers today, you might think of thousands of Muslims there. Well, that wasn't the case at the time. Big event, it'd have like 50 people, right? So it was a small, tight-knit group at that time. And one of these brothers, I, anytime that I felt like I needed to be, to do well or to do good, I would hang out with him. He was above the fray of whatever the young crowd was doing. And one day he gave me, uh, I was listening to a tape in a friend's car. It was a Hamza Yusuf tape. I asked to borrow the tape. I took that tape and I told him, listen, I'm listening to this amazing talk by this guy, Hamza Yusuf. And I was like, converts to me were from East Orange. I was like, is he in East Orange? Can we go see him? Now, East Orange is a bastion of Salafis, right? But it's the only place that there were converts at the time, like massive amount of converts as imams. So I thought he was one of the imams alongside Dawood Adib, Abu Muslima. That's what I thought, okay? Because that was the world that we lived in, okay? And he said, no, 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 he's not from, uh, he's not from East Orange. He's from California. I was like, oh, that's cool. Someone from California. Right. And he said, um, and he's Greek. I thought he was African American the whole time. Right. Because that's what a convert imam, you'd never seen a Caucasian, you had never seen a Caucasian convert imam, a white convert imam. You had not seen that. You'd seen 
Imam Siraj, Dawood Adib, Abu Muslim. So you knew African Americans in New York and New Jersey were, were had become Muslim and were speakers. That you knew. Right. At least me as a teenager. So he said, Listen, let me give you a give you something tomorrow. Next day comes around, he gives me a box like this of v, uh, v, uh, uh, VHS videos and cassette tapes. Back in the day. VHS. Yeah. Uh, some kids might not even know what, what it is, but it's basically what a blockbuster movie used to be like. So I would, at that time, my sister had gotten married and moved out. Me and her lived in an apartment together at Rutgers. She got married. She moved out. So I'm all alone in the apartment. So how do I pass my, you know, what do I do when I'm all alone? Uh, we didn't bother getting cable because this wasn't like a real, I wasn't like really living there, only living there a couple, four, four or five days a week. Right. And then I go back down to my family's house. So whenever I was home alone, I would put the VHS tape in and I would loop that thing. The thing would finish, I'd hit rewind, right? I would must have watched every single one of those videos and listened to every cassette tape minimum 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 five times each each like i would just loop them because there was always something new that you'd learn every single time because he was he'd go on tangents you don't there was no structure to the lecture right there was no structure to the lecture so it's impossible for you to know okay point one two three i'm missing point four right and let me write them down that was impossible he's just going on where he wherever he wants to fly right so you're always learning something new every single time I'd listen to these things and I would start practicing them. And at that time, his, his, the, what was so called to so of in it was not words or terminology. It was actions. So you talk about to Mind you, I was such an innocent Muslim at the time. All is just Islam to me. I know the difference between Dawood Adib, Abu Muslima, all this, uh, Hamza Yusuf, I did not know the difference between any of these things. It's just Islam. So I love that phase. It has a good side and it has a bad side. The good side of it was that the intention was just totally, it was just like, let me get better with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I didn't have many friends who were into seeking knowledge. and It was just totally solitary, right? Just a personal thing between myself and Allah ta'ala. The bad side of it is that you're going to have a shock of your life. If you keep going, you're, you will have a shock of your life, right? And if you don't have a support group, it's going to be a bad shock. And that side did happen, right? Because I then came, you know, sort of hit a wall in the sense of discovered that, hold on, he has opposition. Why do people oppose him? What's going on here? There are two sides. Right. And guess what? Here's the worst part. The side that I'm from, they're against him. Like everyone around me, except for a few people, right? The general vibe in the East Coast was against this stuff. So immediately I went from totally innocent, uh, just practicing Islam, living Islam, and just enjoying this in pure blissful innocence and ignorance. And spun now into a hurricane of conflict. That there's this thing called tasawuf, that they do group dhikr, that they're astray, that they have tariqahs, and they're this, that, and the other. And I'm like, oh no, I'm benefiting. I like this. Like, I'm benefiting from this, though. Like, I truly, genuinely benefited. And my parents saw that I benefited, right? In that uh, I went from somebody who was trying to be good, but just couldn't anymore. Like, was just went the, the regular way of college, high school, and college kids to somebody who had totally reformed back to what's good right uh they saw it so they didn't really stand in in the way because they did alhamdulillah they had a they made an analysis and like a cost benefit analysis right and realized like okay what other option you're going to take this away from someone starving and this is what they're doing now with their time and you're going to object with this so they tried to go a measured route they said okay listen listen to him but just don't innovate right uh, go study with him, but just make sure you don't follow the people who do bid'ah, right? And so they they took that route, and I'm thankful for that because they could have shut it down completely, and I would have been in a big trouble, right? Right. Because there were not there were no options. You got to people have to understand living options. I'm not talking about books on shelves. What does that do for anybody? Living options to teach you and to be an example for you. 
So uh, my, my dad jumped on the opportunity that I like him, and he liked him too. He loved Sheikh Hamza. And we had listened together to the videos. We watched the videos together, all of us at home. And then uh, I found a flyer, be passed out at Rutgers University at the MSA. And I still remember this. It said February 17th, 1997 at the Walt Whitman Auditorium in Brooklyn will be a fundraiser for Masjid Taqwa. And the featured speech, speaker was Hamza Yusuf. Now, at the time, you get a, a piece of paper, just an 8 by 11 printout. And you'd have to give a pile of printouts to an agent who supported you, a volunteer. And that volunteer, that's how you got the word out back in the day. He'd put it in Masajid. He'd give it to people. You got the word out physically by hint. That's how you got the word out, right? Yeah. So I had that paper. I ran home. It was a Saturday. And I asked my I, my mom, said, I, I want to go to this. My dad said, well, I'll go to this. This is great. All took the day out. It was a Saturday. We put on whatever thobes we had. We went. We, uh, Of course, we're from South Jersey. When you go to North Jersey, you do everything you need to do in North Jersey. And Brooklyn. So we went to Brooklyn. We did all the Arab spice shopping in the Arab stores that we don't have. All the halal meat shopping, put it in ice packs, right? Because that's how life was back in the day. You did you did all your Islam, anything Dini, Arab related, you did all in one shot. You visited the people that you wanted to visit, whatever, because it was two hours away. So we did all that. We get to the event and he comes out I couldn't believe what I'm seeing. I hadn't seen this image before. He came out, and I'm looking. I can't wait to see what he's going to come out wearing. What is he going to look like? What's it going to be like? When you see, when you watch someone's videos for three, four months, day in and day out, and then finally you get to see him in person. And it was a limited number of videos. And there wasn't, uh, you got to keep in mind that young people today could keep up with a celebrity the minute by minute. Right? We didn't have you didn't we didn't have that. You had a set number of videos that you just watch those videos over and over. Now you don't know did he change, right? Did, you don't know what the latest thing looks like. So he came out, and the first thing I looked at were his shoes. He was wearing those pointy Moroccan slippers. And I'm like, what? Pointy shoes, right? Like the, and they were flat, tiny, like that, skinny. Have you ever seen those? And he was wearing a red thobe. Jup Jalaba with a hood. I'd never seen a hooded thobe before. Never seen a hood on a thobe ever. I was like, what is this? What's going on here? Right? I've never seen any of this. And then I look up, there's a turban this big. Okay. <laughs> this turban was this big. Right. And he had glasses, no beard, and a goatee. And I'm, it was such a striking image. And it was such a contrast with the typical Egyptian and Palestinian and Saudi garb we're used to. Like the one-banded thobe. Mas maximum, you're going to wear the black and white scarf of the Palestinians on your shoulder. We all wore that. I was wearing that around my neck all day. Um, maybe the Afghani hat was a bit popular at the time. but well, that, that was it, though. That was it, maximum. Yeah, th that's it. Yeah. And, of course, the, there's the Desi uh, shawar kameez. We knew about that, right? But I never had seen anything from California, Caucasian Muslim, Morocco. All of this stuff was new at once. It wasn't like it was a gradation. It was all in one meal, right? It's like, I've never eaten any of this. And then on top of that, now they're saying to Sawuf, right? That I'd never seen discovered too. That was the one that, was, that mattered, right? But the other things were all new too. So it was like a shock of the senses in a sense, but it was like a pleasant shock. Some things I was surprised of, some things I was, I thought were odd, but they grew on me. Like everything Moroccan is odd, but it grows on you, right? right. Like it's odd in the sense of, you'd never expect that. You'd never expect yellow slippers. Like the, they, they wear these yellow pointy slippers. You never expect it, but it grows on you, right? A hooded thobe. Now, everyone knows about the hit of thobe, but at the time, it wasn't really popular. Never seen that, but it grew. On top of that, the thobe that they wore was, like, huge. The style is like that. Under the arm, it's huge. Like, you put your hand out, you're like, it almost goes diagonal, not like a sleeve. Are you talking about the Mauritanian thing? No. The... No, the Moroccan thobes. Okay. If you look at the traditional Moroccan thobe, they're extremely baggy under the arms. Oh, okay. So, it's a whole new look 
and there is there is value to the superficial because sometimes youth are superficial, right? They think something's cool, they latch onto it, and then what's more important gets tucked into it because you're youth, you're a fool, right? You don't know any better, right? And you tack on to what looks cool, right? Uh, and then you uh, you you ingest, you know, you take in, you intake the more important things along with it. And a little bit of that happened with me. I was like, this is so cool. I've never seen anything like this before in Islam. Uh, so I began practicing everything that he was saying, everything. And most of it was Zuhud related to Hajjud. So that practice, I got a lot of benefit. We went, my dad snuck behind the scenes. And he went to the stage, behind the stage. I don't know how he got there, but he got behind the stage. And Sheikh Hamza was writing something down in the corner he looked up he saw these people want to talk to him we walked over he walked over to us and uh we talked for maybe 60 seconds right and he said and he, my dad said my son wants to study with you he said oh, i'm going to be having an intensive and my dad said where he said in fess okay so my dad was like okay you're gonna go so i was just like on cloud nine i get we get home the drive back from brooklyn and he had given a, a wild talk. I'm talking. His talk was like, we're at war. The drums are banging. We're, we're headed to war, right? And at that time, there was a bombing of happening in Iraq. There were U.S. Clinton had ordered a bombing of Iraq. We're at war, right? And it was like intense. He was very political. He was bringing the political side at the time. Okay. Uh, when we get home, we're hanging out. My mom goes downstairs in the basement. She was doing something in the basement. I go hang out next to her, and I bring the atlas, right? And my mom's like, what's that? I was like, oh, it's the atlas, because I'm going to see where am I going this summer. So I look up, and she said, where, did, where is the program going to be? I said, in FES. Okay, so I'm looking it up. I go to the I, and I'm looking I-N-F-A-S, and I can't find it for the life of me, right? So my, so I was like, where's Infest? And she says, just, I never heard of such a city. So then I go up to my dad and said, where is this Infest city? What country is Infest, right? And he, he said, no, it's in Fes. So I was look up Fes, Morocco, and they pronounce it Fes, F-A-S. They don't say Fez, but the atlases all have Fez. I'm telling you, it might've took me an hour to figure out that Fes equals Fez. Morocco. Mm -hmm. And I found Fez Morocco. <clears throat> See, why I target in Dawa that type of innocent Muslim who's just sort of discovering? Because to me, that was the sweetest time. The time of blissful ignorance and innocence. And just truly, genuinely just want to learn the deen for the sake of myself. Right? For the sake of finding some Sakina. Uh, time came. I filled out my application. I did everything I had to do. Mailed it. U.S. mail. Unfortunately, for me, there was a typo in the return address. So this guy was telling me that um, they 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 sent the acceptance letter, right, and it bounced back. And luckily, one day I'm at work. I had a job. A Christian man stops me, and he tries to preach to me the gospel. Okay. So I call this convert friend in Meshul Huda, and I say, hey, you're a convert. How do I talk to this Christian guy? He said, forget that, man. I'm lucky you called. We've been trying to find you. We can't find you because we, they accepted you. They need to cut tickets and visas. You've been accepted like a month ago. You were accepted to this trip, and, and we can't tell you. We, we have no way to tell you and get your information and all that. I'm telling you, that whole summer, from when I filled out that application until I got the news, I was making dua like a madman, right? Like I had never made, prayed for anything as hard in my life to be able to go on this trip. Every day I was thinking, what's it going to be like to go to this foreign country for a month with Hamza Yusuf? Uh, so it, I will, almost missed it. If I had not called that brother, I would have missed it. They would have chosen someone else. And then finally I call a guy. He said, man you had some typos we couldn't communicate with you right so i finally get accepted i get a package back the package has a ticket in jfk it got reading 
from the Masood Khan website. What is a madhab? Uh, what is tasawwuf? What like these basics, right? And I start reading, and I can't really figure much of this stuff out, to be honest with you, right? I can't figure a lot of it out. But I just try to go to so what I can understand, circle that or underline that, and then act upon that. That's that's how I operated. I went through the books. I read everything, right? But I didn't get a lot of things. I finally now um, get to this trip in Morocco. And it was, I have to say, a bit of a shock. And the main part of the shock was none of the shiuch. It was the other students. The other students who were in another mode than I was. They were in the mode of polemics. And they want to make sure that nobody here leaves without understanding that this is what Ahl sunnah is, this is what Salafiyya is, this is what a bid'ah is and isn't, this is what is permitted. And that, I would say, really put me in a position of like my head is spinning. I don't like this at all. Not that I don't like what they're saying, but I don't like the, the fact that this is happening, that there's a conflict like this. So uh, it takes me about another year, I would say, of looking up every issue and trying to find the imam that we have on our bookshelf that is reputed and known and accepted who is confirming what they're saying. And I found that in Imam al Nawawi. I found Imam al Nawawi was the one that both sides cited all the time. And so I started slowly solidifying my understanding and realizing that, yeah, there is a lot of validity to what they're saying of Tasawwuf and that the other side is shutting it out without um, that as an opinion, really. It's not absolutely wrong. Right. right? So I would say that's how it started and that's how it came about. And it was that polemics that for, that do, made me dive into reading a lot of Arabic. Right. And I knew in my heart there was something right about it because I changed because of it. But it's got to have evidence. If it doesn't have evidence, it doesn't stand on two feet. Yeah. And that's where I went to Imam and Noe for the evidence. I need evidence, Right. I need to know for sure. I need to be able to present this to somebody who will say, Aina Dalil. Yeah. And that really, my mom was very impressed, actually. She was very happy. And I had a lot of these discussions with my dad, right? As, as provided I show the evidence, right? But he also uh, was countering and saying, Hey, well, look at these guys uh, dancing and uh, doing Ring Around the Rosie. This is so, <laughs> right? And I would have to find an answer to that, right? Right. I would have to find an answer because he's not coming with theory. He's coming to you with reality. This is what they are doing, right? I don't have an answer to that. I can't answer to that, right? And luckily, YouTube hadn't existed. He would have too much material, right? But he would get some material anytime <laughs> he got any material, and he'd put me on the spot. And that challenge of back and forth is you grow out of that challenge. Right. That's how it all started. Yeah, I, I, I myself, when I was in my uh, my Salafi days, I was the biggest opponent of tasawwuf yeah. uh, based upon absolutely 110% ignorance and the people, the company that I found myself around. But let's let's uh, let's go further. I just this is kind of like an intensive in itself because um, people are. People know that I am upon the, the, the path of Tasawwuf and they're giving a lot of people that are on the path of Tasawwuf trying to improve their hearts a really, really difficult time. So I just want to really um, break down everything, the terminology and the questions that people are wondering so they don't even have to ask. I want this to be on record uh, as, a, as a document, if you will, uh, so, so people can... Uh, refer back to it because there's a lot of what is the so if what is this and what is that hey but the people spin it around in circles i want this to be documented inshallah so we're just gonna uh start up with with uh, terminology sure what what is that what exactly does the so mean what is it 
the definition of tasawuf is the study of all matters related to the purification of the heart and tahqiq al lillah actualizing in our own self and behavior our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by ihsan in our worship right so these are the three things three components to this term it is the knowledge of everything related to the heart meaning not fiqh not aqidah okay everything related to the heart it is with, with the goal the goal of that is tahqiq al lillah to actualize and live the correct servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're his slaves and servants and the method by which we do that is ihsan in worship and that worship. brings me to my next question um, yeah. what are the origins of tasawwuf from the quran and sunnah or if you want to speak about the hadith that you almost went into where jabril alayhi salam sat with the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said what is islam what is iman and what is ihsan the origin from the quran is the dua of sayyidina ibrahim you can say uh in that uh wabath of course every nabi has the same teaching regarding aqidah and the heart these are the two things that never change what changes is the body fiqh and sharia for every nabi has a different sharia right but the aqid is the same and the heart is the same there's no sharia in which envy is permitted for your brother or lusting after women is permitted or hatred of another muslim is permitted so but sayyidina ibrahim says okay this ayah comes four times. Yuzakihim is at the end in three and at the beginning in one. So Yuzakihim. He purifies them. How does he purify them? A prophet, anybody can purify and guide. And what it means for a human to do so is to lead you to guidance or to lead you to the behavior or to help you do the behavior or the ibadat that will purify you, right? So you can purify somebody, only Allah truly purifies them, but your role in purifying somebody is guiding them to the actions that purify. Okay? It's like taking somebody to, uh, taking someone to a table and teaching them how to order the food. So how did the prophet purify? He taught them to pray to Hajjud, he taught them to fast, he taught them how to, re to recite the Quran, how to do dhikr, how to make dua, and did it with them. Prayer in Jama'ah, for example. So likewise, you could take a group of kids and go out in nature and fast, pray to Hajjud, do dhikr. You have a role in purifying them, meaning taking them to the actions upon which Allah brings down his purification. Okay? Sanctification as well. This purification is removing the bad, but you can sanctify and bless something by bringing down the good qualities as well. So... Um, that's like muqaddas and mubarak. Muqaddas, remove all the impurity. Mubarak, bring all the barakah and the increase and the benefits and all these things. So that ayah is sarih, that one of the roles of the Messenger وسلم, is to purify us by teaching us how what to do to purify us. That's how he purifies us. So then you have an expansion of Hadith Jibreel, Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. Iman is codified. We have the Aqidah books. I can go get you Hanbali Aqidah tomorrow. I can go get you Ash'ari Aqidah. I can get you Maturidi Aqidah. I can get you those books. It's codified. Islam is Sharia and Fiqh. It's codified. We can get you any of the four madhabs. And you can get their books on PDF in 20 minutes. You can research them all. You can get them all, right? On PDF. Codified. Well, then how could Ihsan not be codified? How is it that we go from Islam, yes, it's fiqh. Iman, aqidah. Ihsan, oh, just some fuzzy chapters in some old books on raqaiq, but no codification. No, that's not true. I mean, this is from Jibreel, alayhi salam. It has yeah. to be the utmost importance. It has to be so important. And if Allah Ta'ala tells us, he guarantees for us that he preserves our religion for us. And our ulama, they took all the questions regarded to aqidah and they put them in books. 
all the questions regarding Sharia and they put them in books and they discuss them and they answer. Then they put terminology. How could it be that Ihsan comes around? And this is supposed to be the pinnacle now, right? Iman, Islam, Ihsan. Right. And we have no science for this? It has to be a science. Science has terminology, has founders, has origins, has goals, okay? Has manahij even. The madhabs of Ihsan are called the, the different turuq. So Abdul Hassan al-Shadli is different from Abdul Qadr al-Jailani. So that's where the technical term of tasawwuf comes in because the ulama did uh, not want to make a claim about themselves and call themselves muhsineen. Whereas you could say, I'm submitted to Allah. Yes, you can say that, right? You can say, uh, we're believers. Allah in the Quran says, Qulu amanna. Say, say we believe, right? You can be a mufti and say, yes, you can ask me questions. That doesn't make you any better than anyone else. But you can't say, I'm purified. You can't say, I'm excellent. That's a, a, a value that you cannot prove. You can say, I'm a qari. Because we can say, okay, recite. And he recites in front of everybody. So you're a qari. I'm a hafid of hadith. Recite the hadith. We can tell if you're a hafid or not. But your ihsan and your state with Allah is unknown. So you can't make that claim. So, um, so they only made the claim of the closest thing, outward thing that Mark demarcated these people, which is, of course, as we all know, is that they used to wear wool, wool and therefore they became called the Sufiya because of the wool that they wore, right? right. Which is the, the, the outward demarcation uh, of what they have. Because you can't make a claim about yourself and your nafs and your state with Allah. That's... Uh, you can't know it, and we can't know it. Right. Um, what do you say to the people that say, we only need Quran and Sunnah? I mean, what? why do we need tasawwuf? Like, for what? what do you, how do you answer the people that say, why do you need this tasawwuf stuff? Why don't you just stick to the Quran and Sunnah? What do, why do we need tasawwuf? So, uh, uh, like all disciplines, we only need Quran and Sunnah is correct as the sources. But that's like having the sea and the woods, the forest. Clearly, all of our food either comes from land or from sea, right? That's uh, all of our food comes from these sources. So why do we need farms? Why do we need stores? Why do we need butcher shops, right? If we have the land and the sea. So what we're saying here is that nobody goes out to the sea every day to get food. Nobody goes out to the land every day to find meat. Or to find berries or vegetables. So you need specialists to grow the lettuce safely. So not mix with some other thing that can poison you. To grow the animal. To save you the hassle. So why do we have fuqaha and the four madhabs? Why do we have grammarians? Why do we have aqidah books, hadith books? To save us the ability, uh, uh, the work. And to gather it all in one area. And now to pepper it with questions. The good scholars takes all these and he starts before the reader asks questions, he asks questions and asks, like, what is this? What is the difference with this? Can a wali know he's a wali? Can a wali know he's a wali? Can can uh, will I be known to a person? Okay. Uh what is the demarcator of wilaya in the heavens? What are the signs of it on the earth? Okay. What are the things that disqualify from wilaya what would be something that disqualifies someone from being a wali okay so for example we have a hadith on this right so what are the signs and and what is the path of it and then what are the terminology that we're going to develop to express these meanings that's what we call a science and a subject you can put that in a book you can the footnotes could have the evidences so ihsan is codified like anything else, just like fiqh is Islam, aqidah is iman, ilm al-suluk, ilm al-tasawwuf, whatever you want to call it. People have an allergy to the word tasawwuf. La mushahata fil istilah is a saying the ulama came and said, listen, if, if a certain word bothers you for some reason, whatever, pick the word. As is the madmoon that counts, the content that counts. So just say Tazkiyah then, if it bothers you that much. If it bothers you to say Tasawuf, don't say Tazkiyah. Say Tazkiyah. Whatever you want to call it. So my, my, if, next, 
Oh, go ahead. Please go ahead. If you go to um, non-Muslims, you would express it as Islamic spirituality. That's what mm -hmm. they're going to understand. Okay, so the next question is because of uh, what your dad was saying. He was like, oh, look at these guys spinning around in a circle. Yeah. Uh, this is the thing. You know it. Everybody else knows it. Oh, maybe everybody else doesn't know it. But <clears throat> um, in this day and age, and I'm sure in the age when you went to that conference, um, people believe that when you say tasawwuf or Sufis, that all to, all the Sufis are the same. So, uh, for example, if I call myself a Sufi, I don't call myself a Sufi, by the way, but if I say that I'm a Sufi, people would say, oh, so you worship graves and you spin around and you do all these other things. So a lot of people, uh, most Muslims uh, group all of the Sufis with them. And my question is, um, are there deviant groups of Sufis and how do we spot them? And how do we make a difference between the people that are on the real tasawwuf and the people that are really innovating and are deviants and maybe even mushriks? Um, it's a good question, and it's an important question. And I would uh, first thing off the bat is that you can sort of smell a mile away someone who doesn't want to be fair to you, and already has a preconceived conclusion, right? Uh, with those types of people, there's no value in any type of talk with them right only if someone is actually genuinely wants to learn um then we can have a discussion so that's the first thing right off the bat is that there's not even a point in talking to somebody who's going to come at you like that but the groups of sufis you have to look for someone who is a faqih and a alim who's who's guiding the process through the lens and through the parameters of the law of islam of the sharia of the aqidah why because spirituality exists in this in this lower realm of the dunya there's spirituality not all spirituality is good just because something is spiritual doesn't mean it's good right and the sharia comes and tells you this is where it's going to be good it's only going to be good if it's within the bounds of god's book and the son of his messenger وسلم, and in line with the aqidah that we are bound to believe in or obligated to believe in iblis is very spiritual it's spiritual he's unseen right it's spiritual the jinn world is spiritual there's a dark world out there what do you think the hindus are tapping into they have spirituality who cares if they have spirituality jews have law is it the right law right the supreme court has law these are great and from from juristic standpoint they know law they're jurists but is that guided law? Are you going to live and die by that? No. The, the, the Jews have law books. You cannot imagine the detail and the footnoting and everything. Okay? They got a tradition of law. The Supreme Court has a tradition of law. I'm sure that the, the Catholics have a tradition of theology. So what? It doesn't mean it's the right one. Right? right? You got to hit the right target. We have a great military. How are you using your military? So spirituality is something that exists in the world. So just because something spiritual does not mean it's good. It's only good if we can measure it. Uh, measure its location. Is it within line with the... It's uh, like a, a, a... What do you call those? The longitude and latitude, right? Is it in line with, with the space that the Sharia has given us or not? Yeah. Does it contradict our aqidah or not? I could probably find you very quickly. People of Tasawwuf who have gone off on aqidah and so that's bid'ah mufassiqa and bid'ah of ibadah, bid'ah bid in their ibadat, bid'ah in their aqaid. Or you can say to a lesser extent, bid'ah in the general way of life. Right? One of the things that one of the people of Tasawwuf said to me one time is that dhikr and qasida is not the only banner of Islam. There's imams do 10 times more. This may be the spirit and what drives them and what heals them. But a, right, a real imam has to do so much more, right? And Islam itself 
has many different banners. The world of Islamic relief and charity is a banner. Jihad was a banner. It doesn't really have much of an outlet for it anymore. Okay, but it, it's a banner. Okay, what did the Sahaba do? Memorizing the Quran, just uh, praying in the masjid by itself, right? Uh, learning fiqh. All these things are different banners of Islam. So sometimes the Sufi groups, in my view, innovate in that it's completely, it's, I wouldn't say it's an innovation that's sinful even. It's just not correct, rejected. You notice the Prophet said, said, innovation, he said about it, it's rejected, right? So rejected could, doesn't necessarily mean it's sinful. It's just it's an imbalance that we generally, as regular people, reject. So life is not just meant to have just purely majalis and that's it. Like we never do charity. We never do youth work. I think there's spirituality in youth work. There's negative spirituality in youth work. They don't want to play, talk about basketball, eat wings, eat Coke, stay up late. But do you know how important that is? It's negative spirituality. Your spiritual state will go down, but your position with Allah will go up, right? So not all spiritual feelings. The deen is not all spiritual feelings, right? Your position with Allah will go up because you're doing good deeds here. Okay, you're doing what's important. So many, in many cases, a Sufi group is not something that I would uh, look. Does not necessarily just because they have to self. We're not going to just give a blanket. Yes, this is perfect. No, it's, everything can be criticized. So something that I find that, that I don't know if you agree, but a lot of the um, people, and please correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the people that are uh, from the deviant Sufi groups, they have no knowledge of Aqidah or Fiqh. Like they're just purely spiritual, 100%. Yeah. I, I don't like uh, any type of group. Don't, you don't find any value in them when they lack logic. Why is logic important? Logic, it's, or usul, you could say. It's important because it separates claims. The Quranic claim, that's mutawatir, right? The claim right. of your shaykh, right? So they, if they don't lack that, but they also, I find it hard for me to, to feel comfortable with the lack of community awareness. It's like, right. if people didn't have community awareness, you would have never even heard of this. If... Sheikh Hamza Yusuf did not have the da'wah teaching that he took from the Habayb, okay? Habayb Mashur al-Haddad. If he had not taken that, it wouldn't have reached New Jersey. Only because he was out, and if his, the students around Masjid al-Huda had not done any youth work and not invited the high schoolers to hang out with them as college students, I would have never discovered it either, right? Right. So that's where the importance comes around with not just its aqidah and its fiqh, but it's also a well-rounded understanding of life in general. Right. Right. Um, what what groups really have a problem with those that practice tasawwuf, and why do you think that uh, that group or groups in general have such a problem? Um, and I'm talking about some people are so nasty um to to these people why do you think that is and where is it coming from the most well on a lot of things may be mixed between biases temperaments actual justifications and then it's prolonged by branding right it's prolonged by like a position for example like the the right and the trump's supporters on the right their stance towards cnn right it's never going to change no matter what happens it will never change that's just how it is it's solidified on that but what started it off probably the uppity liberal elite look that all these cnn anchors have okay a demasculated male right talking in some kind of uppity elite elitist tone so temperament temperament is part of this some people they are just not interested in spirituality they're interested in Islam. They're interested in Allah and His Messenger. But the idea of the heart and all that, it's not the number one thing that comes to their mind. Some humans are like that. Okay. Number two. So it says temperament's one thing. 
The other thing is biases, right? Because your temperament is different, all of a sudden you will just take the opposite side of everything in a debate. I'm sure we've seen that in families, right? You've seen that in, in certain friend groups growing up or, or in extended families where two people, they think differently, they look at the world differently. By default, if you go right, he's going to go left. If you go up, he's going to go down. It has to be like that. So that's like a bias. You're not truly against that position. You're only against that position because he took that position. Right. Number three, justified reasons. There's justified reasons. Sometimes when Salafis call something to be an innovation, sometimes it is an innovation, right? Sometimes in our own tradition is differed upon. They may take it to the point of, no, it's an innovation. You're not even in Ahl Sunnah anymore. And if we go to our books and say, no, it is an innovation, but it doesn't remove you from Ahl Sunnah. It's just, a, it's an innovation. It's a difference of opinion. So sometimes it is justified. And in the real world sense, of course you're justified. You want to join a religion where people are doing something that's crazy or silly, or we all know the videos that went around for the electric shock, Sheikh, right? Where you shake his hand and you get buzzed and you get shocked, who wants to ever be part of that? If you're like, would you want to show your neighbor that? Would you want to take, you want to bring that video to school and say, here, this is my religion, right? Or would you rather take a nice picture of like Mecca with the, the circles, perfect order, beauty, right? And this is it, or pictures of the Ottoman Masajid or something like that and say, no, that's my religion. So uh, there's justified reasons, okay? For, they don't have, there is no smoke without any, you can't have a fire without any fuel whatsoever. It cannot all be lies. There has to be some truth to it. The question is, are you using the truth honestly? Or are you adding, you're expanding it, right? I bet you CNN, 95% of it's harmless, right? So, but the right wing will only go after it using that 5% screw-ups that they've done, right? And they'll expand that 5%. Like my... Uh, I, 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 I got a brother, friend of mine, who said some things in the past that he was he felt bad about, right? I'll tell you, Jonathan Brown. He said some things in the past that he realized was not right. He changed his position on things. Yet some people are still quoting the old position and smearing him with it, right? He said something about the Prophet Sallallahu Took it back. Okay. Said something about a position about maybe supporting gay marriages. Took it back. I don't know what else. He said things. He took it back. He made a mistake. He's telling you he's made a mistake. Right? He took it back. Yet people go with the old thing and smear him with it. Is that fair? So you you did take something that was true. But it was it a full truth or an incomplete truth? Sensationalism. You sensationalize an incomplete truth. It was true. He himself negated it. So are you not, are you being honest about your critique of the person or dishonest here? Dishonest. That's where we're, that's where we take it. So it's dishonesty. Add that stuff all together. And it just becomes after that part of the culture that we are against this thing, the whole thing, no discussion. So uh, that's, that's pretty much how groups form and they become just hardened against each other. There's no point in, in melting melting the edges and bringing them together anymore right but let me ask you uh, next question is about hadras uh, slash yeah. slash uh group dhikr yeah. is there is there a where did the history come from is it from the sunnah is it halal makru take us through that Sheikh. the ha the so okay so let's start with the group dhikr. uh first of all it's in sahil bukhari that the prophet sallam used to do the tasbih after salah he used to do it out loud and the Sahaba would recite it with him. There's no reason this says why he did that. But I think that we can assume that he was teaching the Sahaba how to do it. And there were a lot of new Muslims coming in. A lot of new Muslims. So in order for them to know how, what to say after Salah, the Prophet ﷺ said it out loud. The Sahaba after him said it out loud. Ibn Abbas says in two narrations in a row in Sahih Bukhari, he knew that he missed the prayer when he heard the dhikr. From the street. From the street from far out from the masjid, but he would hear the dhikr after salah, the tasbih, after uh, he knew that this is the end of the salah. 
No, is that is that a hadith that people can go and, and reference right now? Or yeah, it's in Sahih Bukhari. Okay. Try to look at the chapter of why don't you look it up for us? In Sahih Bukhari, chapter of Adhan and the Bab of Dhikr uh after Salah. And that, that's that's like huge because that's that's the whole premise of people saying why do you need to come in a group? Just do your yeah. dhikr after salah, but what you're exactly. saying now is like huge. Here. Oh, it's in where is it? Okay, good. I think it's in there, right? It everybody, should be in there. Everybody listen up to if that. I, Here we go. If I left it out of my dhikr book, then uh, it's a big mistake. <clears throat> For the people that are saying, just follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah. Here we go with the Sunnah. Yeah, so this is in, uh, I would know that I had missed the prayer when I hear the loud dhikr coming from the mosque. Let me read you more. Okay. Let okay. me read you another one. Okay. No group of people gather for the remembrance of Allah except that the angels surround them closely. Mercy envelops them and tranquility descends upon them. And Allah mentions them among those that are with him. Important, important the word them is used. Yes. Plural. They're in a group. Okay. Allah has traveling angels scanning the earth seeking gatherings of dhikr. Majalis al dhikr. So what is happening in this dhikr? Now that's the question. Is that talking about fiqh, talking about tafsir, or making tasbih, or making du'a? It just doesn't, doesn't mention. It just leaves it blank. Mm -hmm. So let's take another look at another one. Prophet ﷺ came out upon some companion sitting in a circle making dhikr. Yadhkurun Allah. Yathkurun Allah meaning what? Everyone giving a lesson on his attribute or saying tasbih and dhikr. Okay. The Prophet asked, what made you sit like this? They said, we are remembering Allah and praising him. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jibreel had just come to me and informed me that Allah is showing you off to the malaika. Subhanallah. Okay. The Prophet passed by two gatherings of companions. Now this is the hadith. That proves to us that when they say gathering of dhikr, it does not mean gathering of talking, right? It means actual dhikr with dua. One group were remembering on Allah and supplicating unto him, making dhikr and dua. And the other group was teaching knowledge. And the Prophet, therefore, a dhikr, majalis al dhikr, yashtamil a dhikr wa dua wal ilm. It, it gathers dhikr, dua, and ilm. Because here, you have two different groups. So the hadith is sarih. That is two different things. Okay, Prophet ﷺ said, both are full of goodness as one is better. Meaning the one of knowledge is better. When you have knowledge, you won't be able to prove your dhikr. Right? And other things. And many other such hadiths. All right? And the people can find this all in Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari. No, these are from different books. The one Bukhari is the one I told you about Ibn Abbas. Okay. And you could check the chapter of Adhan. I'm pretty, I mean, I could probably find it for you here. I might, or why don't you look it up for me here? Look it up. Because the people are going to ask about, you know, references, you know. Ask for references. All these right. And it's the right. Right. Yeah. Now, let me say this now. Sure. So the dhikr out loud is established. There's no doubt about it. So where is the question mark now? Question mark now is, in one voice or separate, cacophonously or harmoniously. There's no mention of it, right? But we do have a mention of cacophony in one different siyaq, a different context, and we do have a mention of harmony in a different context. That would make us feel and believe that Islam prefers, Allah and his messenger prefer the harmony over the cacophony. So what's the proof? So Prophet said, if any of you were to say Amin, and his Amin is in line, matching the Amin of the Imam, and that Amin is matching in line with the Amin of the Malaika, all his sins are forgiven. So that means there is a virtue when all the voices are in line. My Imam, Amin, okay, and the Amin of the angels, sins are forgiven, right? Uh, the Imams, Amin, all three of groups so that will tell you that in general things being in harmony is better okay than being scattered what else we know that in the time of Sayyidina Umar the hadith of Tarawih says you would find a man praying by himself another man praying with a rahd which means a group a large group 
one man praying Jama'a over there, another Jama'a over there, another man praying separately, until the Sahaba realized there's too much noise here. Nobody can focus like this. And then Omar ibn Khattab gathered them behind Ubay bin Kaab. Okay? Then next day, he came in upon the Tarawih, Ubay bin Kaab was leading the Salah, and he found order in the Masjid. One Tarawih, not five, six, seven, eight, ten different Tarawihs. So what does that tell us about the cacophonous sound versus the harmonious sound? Also so, proved that there was a Bidah Hasana. It also proves that it was a Bidah that it was Hasana because it never happened in the time of the Prophet's son. So let us ask the question now. If nobody can tell, if the hadiths are not crystal clear, that are there loud voices all together or separate, clearly nobody can choose either one, right? So therefore both of them must have permissibility. And there's no prohibition, nothing on record. There's nothing on record saying gather together in dhikr but do not dare have one harmonious voice. And in fact, we've shown other evidences where harmony is better in, Islam, in, in our understanding. Okay. So now we have another question. The question of are you allowed to schedule this? So that comes, well, if shouldn't be just for dhikr, it should be for everything else. Are you allowed to schedule an act of worship? So I'm going to do, I'm going to recite a juz after us. We're all going to get together and have a juz after us. We're all going to get together and read the wirid after maghrib. Okay. Now that we said that one voice or separate voices out of the, is not an issue, gathering together is not an issue, now the issue of scheduling these things. Well, that's the least of issue of, of all. Because where it, the whole deen is scheduled. Salah is scheduled. Allah didn't say pray five times whenever you want. Right? So I may say, yes, Allah and his messenger may schedule something, but we may not. Because it may be an innovation. And I agree that it may be. Provided that we clarify that this is merely for the purpose of efficiency. Or barakah of that time. Because Allah has himself and the Prophet Sallallahu have specified certain times as being blessed such as the hour before maghrib on friday or all of thursday night something like that so either for scheduling or because it's a blessed time I, it's very hard it's a hard sell that anything scheduled is a bid'ah because all of life is scheduled even abbas used to schedule lessons he said there is a lesson for the uh, Ghazawat, Maghazi, where he's going to talk about the battles of the Prophet. That's the first proto sira class. Another one about Ahkam, another about Quran, another about Hadith. Sayyidina Ibn Abbas had a schedule. Okay, So that issue of scheduling a set, set time for something is not, it's not really an issue. Now let's bring us to another one. So people can be on time and at the same, so they don't miss anything. Exactly. So they don't miss anything, and it's a commonsensical behavior we do in everything else. Yeah. Right. Everything else is scheduled. You go to an Islamic college, it's scheduled. Right. Uh, let's go to now the content of what's being said. The content of what's being said is dhikr and dua limited, or is it open? Open. It's open. So, what's the proof? Proof is that when it's limited, there is a word from the Prophet that tells us it's limited. Like what? Pray the way you see me pray. That means there is no valid salah if the Prophet didn't do it. How about hajj? Take your hajj rituals from me. That means watch me make hajj. You do the exact same thing. Don't add anything. Don't subtract anything. You found it? Okay. The dhikr and dua is repeated many times in the quran there is and in the sunnah there's no stipulation that you can only remember allah and pray in there's no stipulation at all so in order for it to be stipulated we need a stipulation pray as you see me pray there's nothing to say, make dua as you see me make dua make dhikr as you see me make the prophet gave us so many adaya imam and book is this big you'll never finish it in your life okay there are so many routes to dhikr and dua that 
there's so many of God from the Prophet There's so many adaya, and the dua also can be totally from yourself. It doesn't have to have any backing. There's actually only one criterion mentioned over and over in the Quran, which is kathira. The kathra is mentioned many times. Just look at the word dhikr and look at the word kathir and you find them almost always matched up, right? And anything that must be much is going to be open-ended, okay? Now let's take a look at this one. It is book four. This is Bukhari, right? Sahih Bukhari. Book four. Ibn Abbas reported dhikr. I don't know how this is not in the dhikr book. It's got to be in the... Totally missed that. Dhikr. In a loud voice, after the obligatory prayer, was a common practice during the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah. And when I heard it, I knew that they had finished the Salah. That is had Book 4, number 1210 and 1211. Okay. So Rub Dhikr did come from the time of the Sahaba. Chap chapter 67, Dhikr after Salah. Ibn Abbas says, we used to know, we, meaning not just him, we used to know that Allah's messenger had finished his salah when we heard the takbir out loud. Okay. We knew the finishing of the prayer of the messenger of Allah through the loud takbirs. Amr ibn Dinar said, I made mention of this to Abu Mas'ud. Okay. And he said, uh, this is not what I have narrated. So he says, this is not one of my narrations. He didn't hear that from Ibn Abbas. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that is chapter 67. And the book is... Hold on. Kitab al-Salah. Kitab al-Salah. Subhanallah. Right? Chapter uh, Vikr after Salah. How how simple is that? How clear is that? So the out loudness is not an issue. The groupness is not an issue. The harmoniousness is not an issue. And not only harmonious, the harmonious argument is almost funny to me. If you believe and you hold that there can be loud dhikr in a group, but it cannot be harmonious, cannot be in one voice. Show me where that is and anywhere on the earth. What about aid? What about the takbir of aid? Yeah. Show me where it where does it exist and would anyone want to enjoy it? So forget enjoyment, because that's not a legal argument. But <clears throat> where does it exist in the world? If you were to take people and I'll hand out takbirat al Eid, put it on the projector, and they're going to recite takbirat al Eid within a minute or two, they will all be in unified. It's a human nature to be harmonious, right? It's like it's an instinct created in the world. You bring your blue pill, they will harmonize. Okay. So all of these. Now let's get to the next question that you brought up. The movements. Right. There's different they differed upon whether or not you can move in this. There was some narration said the Sahaba used to sway. Naturally, not by purpose, not intentionally. They used to sway. But if a person was to stand up as they do in Syria and bow and hold hands and bow together, right? The ulama differed upon this severely. They differed severely. They did. They differed severely on less than this, which is simply standing up. And in Mecca, the Meccans were the first people to stand up in the middle of the Mawlid at the chapter where the Prophet's birth was recited. Like the praise of the Prophet, his, they basically used, the Mawlid started as a recitation of the Sira. Once they got to the chapter where the Prophet was born, they stood up out of respect to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Like as if he's entering the room. He entered the earth. They entered the room. This too was severely differed upon by the scholars. So we say we have no problem. If someone differs with that. Okay. That was a, that was tied to my next question of you know uh, you know yeah. how the Turks they go in circles and the yeah the, the, the Chechens you know they run like in circles yeah so around. I would say about those is that 
The difference of opinion, let's put the parameters of the difference. The difference of opinion can be a bid'ah that is sinful, a bid'ah that is discouraged, a bid'ah that is permitted. It's not going to go to be a bid'ah that's recommended, right? Unless you say you're adding exercise to it or something like that. I don't know, right? But it's gonna, that's the range of the bid'ah. Now, what bid'ah will it not be? It will not be bid'ah of aqidah. That removes you from Ahlul Sunnah. That I think me and any honest scholar must agree upon that, right? Any honest scholar will agree. That's the parameter. And to me, I personally say, put it where you want. I don't care. Put it as bid'ah that's forbidden. Put it as a bid'ah that is discouraged. Put it as a bid'ah that's permitted. I have no horse in this battle because it doesn't make a difference. To establish majalis dhikr, where we could encourage people to do dhikr by ha handing out a book and we all recite the book together that's the goal that's what's effective that's what benefits societies and communities and people and youth and regular people that would never ever sit and remember allah for an hour now they are they're doing it because of this action and the prophet had established this in medina for a different purpose i believe i believe the purpose was not that they needed to learn how they needed to do that because their hearts were dry. No, I don't believe that was the reason. The reason is they didn't literally didn't know what to say. So it's a teaching tool. It's a helping tool. The prophet used it to teach them what to say after Salah. Okay. But the, the precedent was set of helping people that the doing it in a group and out loud is to help people. So if we're looking now and we're saying that people are on their phones all the time, there are, listening to music all the time they're not in ghafla they don't have the discipline to sit down and remember Allah they don't even know what to do you give a lecture on go and do they could no one knows what to do right but if you sit down and you model it and you demonstrate it for them and you make it a habit because people have discipline issues every other Friday or every Friday or every Thursday we're doing this all of a sudden you have a lot of benefit that's where my personal concern is as for the other things, I could care less about them. Call mm -hmm. them what you want to call them, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Is every single awliya upon tasawwuf? Is it a is it a key to become an awliya of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? Uh, yes and no. Yes, in practice. No, in terminology. Okay. You cannot have a wali of a person who attains wilaya with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without checking their heart. That person, I guarantee you, checks their heart. We call that muraqaba. Okay. Does they don't need to know it's called muraqaba, but they must check their heart. Muraqaba meaning drawing closer to Allah. Muraqaba is guarding my heart. Mm -hmm. A raqib, it's like an investigator, right? Oh. Okay. He must investigate his heart. For riya, ikhlas, hasad, hub dunya, hub jah, love of reputation, love of power, riyasa. There's no way, there is no way that someone could be a wali Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they never do this. Because, I mean, all of those things have to do with the heart. They all have to do that. And, and here's the thing they don't even know what to, they don't even know how to give terms to these things. That's where I say no about the terminology. Yes, about the madmoon, the reality of the thing. What about what else? They they cannot possibly possess a false idea about Allah. Mm -hmm. Their 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 aqaid regarding the Prophet cannot be incorrect. Their aqaid about the Sahaba would not be incorrect. Mm -hmm. They will not be, for example, perennialists believing, oh, this is just Islam is just one of the paths to the truth. No, right? They will not have uh, ideas about the Sahaba, ill feelings towards the companions. They would not have ill feelings towards the Ummah. Forget the companions. The Ummah of Islam. You had to have a clean heart towards the Ummah. Let alone the companions. So uh, Okay, but can you have a clean heart just by being cerebral and, and academic? Um, there must be, I would also say, a worshipful element to this person. That's what I believe. It, it does it have to be dhikr? No, it could be recitation of Quran, which is dhikr. Uh, dhikr, I mean tasbih with the beads. 
-hmm. it could be intensive dua it could be uh, quran it could be sadaqa there must be action there has to be action because right. sadaqa is almost like the tahara you purify your heart from the dunya when you do that and dhikr and tasbih and ibadah is your connection to allah that's where you grow with allah subhanahu you cannot have a non-worshipful wali every wali allah must have some ibadah that they're doing the ibadat may be different khalid ibn walid did he sit for majalis i doubt it he went for war that was what the time called for is he not he's greater than wali he's sahaba Allah. so so there are different forms there are ways but there must be something you cannot be a bare bones five prayer a day and that's it type of muslim there must be something of ibadah by which you draw near to i'm sure khalid ibn walid felt something any soldier feels some nearness to allah while walking on the battlefield sure yeah okay so we got about three quick questions uh, okay let's take them rapid fire inshallah to cover everything no no, no not from the sure. people from me okay um so let's let's get into mode um the first mode that i went to was maybe um I, I believe like four years ago it was a senegalese beautiful molded a lot yeah. of people, a lot of people have like misconceptions of what mole it is because of these you know people that are jumping around in the in the masajid and carrying on you know the electric movi carrying on and with this nonsense but when i sat down wallah al-azim we were like all past little um uh covers of the quran pages and you know a laminated covers and we were all to read the Quran. That's how we started it. And we finished the Quran in about 35 to 40 minutes. Where is the wrong in getting together and reciting the Quran, all of it, and just doing a khatam in the Quran in 40 minutes, zero. And then we did salawat upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nobody was jumping around. Nobody was spinning. Um, we were talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his life and his death. People were crying out of love for the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam upon hearing the story of his death, and then we ate food and we dispersed. Now, my question is, um, can we do maulid? People are saying, well, the, the, none of the Sahabas did it. Well, none of the Sahabas did it because uh, the majority of them lived in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, how do we navigate that as Muslims in this day and age? A salah on the Prophet in general was. Uh something that was almost not necessary as a practice in the time of the companions because they could physically see the prophet physically they could go to the prophet physically uh remembrance of allah in jannah what well, it doesn't it's not necessary anymore because you get to see allah directly right you only remember someone who you're not seeing right so the Sahaba, there in general, Salah on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi came for those who come after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they have took their share of doing it. Of course they did. Ibn Mas'ud said, uh, you should not, do not allow Friday to go by without having done a thousand Salah on the Messenger, peace be upon him. It's narrated by Ibn Qayyim. But, uh, yeah, obviously he gets it from somewhere because he's not a direct transmitter, but he gets it his, from some source. But, Point being is that all of these things on the remembrance of the Prophet ﷺ is unnecessary when you lived with the Prophet, peace be upon him. And they develop afterwards when a disease occurs and a problem occurs is that the people have, we've lost sight of the Prophet ﷺ. We've lost sight of the seerah. We have very little zeal for the seerah. And therefore, we're not imitating the messenger, peace be upon him. So when that problem developed, a solution needed to be developed. There's no disease except Allah creates for it a cure. Okay, and the purposeful seasonal remembrance of the Prophet as acted as a cure for the Ummah for this problem, right? And it, it's one of the best cures to take Rabi al Awwal and say, On this day, we're all going to talk about the Prophet this month, this whole month. Rabi al Awwal, we're going to talk about the Prophet as a scheduling. unit. You, you basically uh, Ummah wide scheduling of it, right? So that it's concentrated like Ramadan. Most people, their iman gets concentrated in Ramadan. It's get built up in Ramadan and then use it for the rest of the year, right? So when all the masajid are doing, you can't avoid it. And it's easy to schedule it and to do it and have gatherings for it. 
that is the function of Rabbi I remember from Sheikh Sha'rawi, he said the religion is mawasim, seasons. Ramadan is a season of Quran and Siyam and Qiyam. Three things in one month. Siyam and Qiyam and Qiraat al-Quran. Right? Oftentimes people add to that is the month they give out their zakah. Right? Uh, you look around, you go to Hajj a couple month and a half after Ramadan, you have Hajj, right? And it's a time for purification and the journey of a lifetime. So likewise, they establish these mawasim so that we can concentrate everyone on one thing so that it would be pow a powerful cure for the ummah. And that's the justification behind it. Secondly, okay. the simple justification is I'm allowed to celebrate anything in Islam as long as it's halal. I can celebrate anything I want. If I have a silly soccer team that wins a championship, I can I can set up a schedule, a date, and celebrate it. Right? We can have a reunion every year for for that championship, and no one will tell me anything about it. So you can celebrate whatever you want annually. Okay, mm -hmm. as long as the content is halal. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> second to the last question: Istirada, istirada, simplified for the layman. Istighatha, simplified for the layman, comes from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that uh, has various different channels, saying if your animal is lost from you, call out. There are slaves of Allah, angels, working and doing things for Allah subhanahu wa taala in the empty deserts. So say, Ya ibadi, a'inuni. Call out to the angels and say, Oh, slaves of Allah, help me. And if you're if you lose your animal, if your animal goes away from you and you're trying to catch your animal, say, Ya ibad Allah, ihbisu. O slaves of Allah, you're talking to the angels. Trap them. They made qiyas on this that you can do this for the prophets, and they made qiyas on this, you could do this for the awliya. This is from and Allah knows best. That's the basis of istighatha. Okay. Asking help from that which is unseen. Not uh, not ala al ibadah, not in the main method of ibad in the method of i need some help that's it this so is someone what, falls over and calls for you to hold them up what is the drowning main, in the sea what is this main confusion yeah that so uh, like the sufis go to the grave of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam raise their hands and say they're, they're praying to muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and these awliya or whatever they go to the graves What's that all about? Why why don't people understand? What why don't they understand that nobody is praying to Muhammad? This is this is shirk. I mean, we talked about it on another live stream where I mean, after all the sahabas and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam went through all of the of the combating shirk in the Quraysh society in Mecca pre-Islam, after all of that, you the simpleton, the Salafi, you have arrived at Islam is basically worshiping graves or asking, you know, committing shirk. Yeah. Where, where did they get this from? Like, what is the separation? So uh, let's just take this one question of um, uh, facing the grave of the Prophet. Malik was asked about that. If I'm at the grave of the Messenger وسلم, and making dua, do I turn my back to face the Qibla or do I stay facing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Malik answered, if he was alive, would you turn your back on him? Uh -huh. So the rulings to the Prophet while dead are the rulings while alive because uh -huh. he's alive in his grave. So I believe personally that we had an era in Islam in which uh, the common man was very ignorant. People were very ignorant and they lacked a, they stay, the, the istighatha element had become uh, disproportionately part of their life to go to the grave of so-and-so you're going to get married to go to the grave of so-and-so you're going to have a baby and it entered a, a level of innovation and a level of imbalance that required a correction right and that's where I say when every time you have two opposing groups there's a lot of things biases temperament but there's also justified reasons right that maybe they treated it importantly or mistreated it or treated it unfairly, sorry, 
or fairly or unfairly, there's some justified reason. And I tend to think that that's the origin of this allergy against the graves or this reputation against the graves because there must be some kind of reality to it. And in reality may simply be a disproportionate, like you never pray, obey Allah, do ibadah, do Quran, like you're not even a religious person. Yet you want to get pregnant, you go to the grave. Something's wrong here. Istighatha, I guarantee you, in the life of every fiqh studying, aqidah, knowledgeable, tasawwuf oriented person, student of knowledge or scholar, istighatha is a purely academic subject. So nobody is going really. to the grave, and at, nobody of the Sufis are praying to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Oh, that, that's never the case. But even even in our world, in the United States, let's say hypothetically, in the United States, mm-hmm. even I would say the bulk of the Muslims in the Arab world now, okay, the idea that we're gonna okay, let's go to the the, the let's go do a sirata. You see, it never happens, right? It's almost like it's like I I've, I've lived a lot. I spent a lot of time with them. I hardly see it, right? Yes, go to the graves. They do all the time. For the, the blessing of that person being in that grave, meaning the baraka, meaning the place of sakina, place of paradise, because they died upon, we know how they died. So that gives us a certain a, a, a type of confidence that this is from awliya Allah, or they're a sahaba, or they're the prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa So going to graves happens all the time. Mm-hmm. But... The expressions of istighatha, it's more rare than, it's like you never see it, right? So I think what it is, is the imbalance of people that are not even religious people. The regular guy. Yet, when he wants something from Allah, he's got to go to the grave of a, of a saint or a wali. And it causes the imbalance. It looks odd. Uh, it seems odd. So therefore, there must be something wrong with it. And so that's where I think that correction came from. And now I think it's probably used unfairly beyond that. Like we said, there could be justifications, but the question is, are you using it fairly or not? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, 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 well, one of the final things I have is, um, what would you like to say? A lot mm-hmm. of people will, are, are going to be watching this, people that love you, people that despise you, people that don't understand you uh, and what you have said. What would you say to them uh, about the what, what was What would be your final cap on this whole thing? I would say about to so if look leave off forget the terms if the terms are bothering people forget it if the groups are bothering people forget it but everybody every one of us must do look into our hearts and remove envies hatreds mockery uh despising the ummah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and every one of us must think about death Think about meeting Allah. Think about meeting the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And every one of us can sense when our heart's getting rusty and when it's sweet. And it gets rusty because of sins that we do. Internal sins and external sins. And it becomes sweet when we avoid these things. The internal flaws such as envy and hatred uh, and the external flaw, uh, uh, deeds. We do when we do those good when we do a lot of remembrance of Allah, it softens and it becomes sweet. And when we engage in those other things, it becomes crusted over and rotten on the inside and hard, and you feel depressed and miserable. Every one of us must have a gauge with that. We all have a gauge, and we exist to seek one and avoid the other. Right? You can call that what everyone doesn't make a difference. Okay. But that's the reality. That's the madmoon of it. And if all of us are trekking that path, then we will become examples and we'll be able to transmit our deen to the next level because once your heart softens, people love you. One of the signs of the soft heart is people incline towards you. So your kids will take on your Islam after you. Your neighbors will like you. That's how the deen spread, in my opinion. It, yes, it spread by the sword, of course, but the actual conversion spread by people who had hearts like that. And... Mm-hmm. That's where the Prophet ﷺ said, qalbak, ask your heart. When things are right or wrong, ask your heart. Meaning, it doesn't have anything in the sharia. It's a judgment call. The clean heart should point you to the right direction. So finally, I, I want to 
take this opportunity to uh, talk about arcview.org. Uh, briefly, tell us what, what do you have going uh, as, as far as your, your courses that you do? Okay, so uh, Safina Saadi is basically the Nothing But Facts live stream, which is seeking to direct people to take ArcView courses, which are courses in Aqidah, courses in Fiqh, courses in Tasawwuf, courses in Arabic, in Hadith, in Tajweed with Nuh Saunders. So we have a lot of classes, and we systematize them. By each subject, the courses are numbered, so you could advance slowly. We teach all four methods. All four methods are there. So uh, the first level is the ArcView Basic. You sign up for the first time. You start studying. You take these courses one th at a time. You get connected to a WhatsApp group. And that WhatsApp group it becomes the place for your Q&A. And you get to learn and essentially have a dialogue with your teacher. Q&A with your teacher through the WhatsApp group. Uh, the WhatsApp group is as important as the course the course is just a screen the whatsapp group is a human being that you're talking to and you develop a relationship with that human being we are also arcview seeks to develop relationships between our teachers and the students so that they could m develop an, a virtual sohba with their teacher and the prices are like it, they're 10 almost bucks a month Arc, arcview basic is essentially free yeah Arcview Basic is essentially free. And believe it or not, the, the platform that we're on, they're doubling their charge on us. They're doubling it. Right. I sent an email saying, by the way, next year, 2020, this year, the prices are doubling. So for us to use that platform, we're going to have to pay them double now. But we're not raising the price on anybody else. It's still $10 a month. And there's like 67 courses you can take in the Basic, I believe. Yeah, we now have 67 courses, and we have five instructors that you will be consistently you can uh, be in contact with subhanallah yeah. well uh i i want to thank you for your time this is something that i wanted to talk about for a long long time so it's been documented i believe we've covered all areas but the, my last request is if you could take us out with dua nur inshallah bismillah i know let's pull that up inshallah <clears throat> so I, I should have told you before no no but it's okay no problem i have it here jazakallah yeah. thank you oh, yeah no, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Okay, here we are. Uh, Second. Mm. Yeah, check this one. See if it's the right volume that has it. It may or may not have it. And everybody that's watching this at the end, I would really, um, <clears throat> even if you disagree with what Dr. Shadi said, he's given, mm. he's given plenty of references from uh, the Sunnah and what book and the number and everything. So please do research that uh, information that he has given if you truly do uh, want to learn your own deen. Here we go. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma jalli nuran fi qalbi wa nuran fi qabri wa nuran fi sam'i wa nuran fi basari wa nuran fi sha'ri wa nuran fi bashari wa nuran fi lahmi wa nuran fi dami wa nuran fi idhami wa nuran fi asabi wa nuran min bayna yadayya wa nuran min khalfi ونورا عن يميني ونورا عن شمالي ونورا من فوقي ونورا من تحتي اللهم زدني نورا وأعطني نورا واجعلني نورا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله